All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Kevin Taylor, Fire Chief of the Montecito Fire Department, and I'd like to welcome you to our virtual community meeting. Our topic tonight is wildland fire prevention. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy lives to attend. It's our pleasure to partner with the Bucker Brigade and Mirage to present this very timely information on our Ready, Set, Go program, which was completely updated by our fire prevention staff earlier this spring. Hopefully, most of you that are on the webinar received this in the mail and have reviewed it, but if you haven't, we've attached a copy in the chat function of Zoom. As you are no doubt aware, this year's fire season has been unprecedented in California. We're very fortunate to have with us wildland specialist Maeve Juarez and Division Chief Operations Alan Widling to present you with Ready, Set, Go. Maeve's going to talk about the preparation phase that's ready and set. And then Alan will cover Go, the evacuation phase and the minor changes that have occurred to evacuation centers as a result of COVID-19. He'll introduce you to a new term called temporary evacuation point. As you know, since you logged in, we're using the Zoom webinar platform for this first ever virtual community meeting. The webinar feature has everybody muted and your cameras disabled, but you are able and in fact encouraged to ask questions by typing them into the chat function, which is being monitored by our administrative assistant, Joyce Reed. She will collect those questions and one of the presenters will answer them at the conclusion of the presentation. With that, thank you again for sharing your evening with us and please welcome our wildland specialist, Maeve Juarez. Good evening, thank you, Chief. Okay, so we're gonna start off this evening by kind of talking about the current situation. As Chief Taylor mentioned, this is an unprecedented fire season. And for those of you that maybe haven't been watching the news, I just wanted to kind of recap uh, the situation that we're going into because it's been a, a pretty wildfire season. So there are currently 18 large wildfires burning in California, Oregon, Colorado, Wyoming, and Arizona, with over 400,000 acres actively burning within the state. So those numbers right there are unprecedented for the fact, not only just for any time of year, but in October, we shouldn't be sending people to fires in Colorado, Oregon, Wyoming, or Arizona. There are over 14,000 fire personnel committed to fires within California. This year, wildfires have now burned over 4 million acres in California. There have been 31 fatalities and over 9,000 structures destroyed in California alone. Santa Barbara County is on the tail end of several red flag warnings for sundown or wind events. The National Weather Service does not have a reprieve date in sight. In fact, there is talk of another high pressure system developing over the Great Basin, which will bring another round of hot, dry northeast winds to the area early next week. Due to unprecedented and historic fire conditions throughout the state, the United States Forest Service has closed all 18 national forests in California. I worked for the Forest Service for 20 years before I came to Montecito, and that's something that I had never heard of being done in my entire career. So wildfires are getting bigger, longer, and killing more people than ever before. The California fire season is now 90 days longer than it was in 1970. Each year, we introduce a new mega fire. So we talked about the Thomas fire, then the following year, there was the Mendocino complex, and now this year, there is the August complex, or it's not the August complex. Do you remember what it's called on the Mendocino? by chance. I believe it's the July fire on the Mendocino, which has now gone over a million acres, which is now the new mega fire in California. There's not enough aircraft to fight these types of fires. We cannot build larger fire engines or put more firefighters on the front lines. There needs to be a change in education, in response, and in fire prevention. And you're doing your part today by listening to this presentation. So some important local wildfire history for those of you folks that are on the Zoom this evening. The Refugio Fire of 1955, the Coyote Fire of 1964, the Romero of 1971, Sycamore 1977, Painted Cave 1990, Zaka 2007, the T Fire 2008, Gap 2008, Hasusita 2009, Gibraltar 2015, Sherpa 2016, Whittier 2017, the Holiday of 2018, and the Cave of 2019. So if you live in Santa Barbara County, you live in the path of one of these wildfires. Each one of these previously listed fires either destroyed homes or took lives, with the exception of the Gibraltar and the Cave fires. 
We want to empower you to take action to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your neighbors. So we're going to go with Ready, Set, Go. When we, talk about, when we talk about preparedness, we want it to be simple. So we break it down to ready. We want you to be ready with preparedness, set. We want you to have adequate situational awareness, example, paying attention to the weather, and go. We want you to go early and know where you and your loved ones are going. Oh, we went a little crazy there. Hope I'm not making you all sick with the screen. Let's see here, there we go. Okay, so how do you get ready? Protecting your home with proper defensible space and home hardening procedures. The Montecito Fire Department offers free defensible space surveys to leave you with a plan to make your home and your neighbor's home safer from wildfire. Home hardening could be a presentation all on its own, but for information on that, please visit our website or schedule a defensible space survey. Our biggest gap is how to be ready, how to prepare and what to do and where to go. So how the Montecito Fire Department helps you get ready. We've improved building and fire codes. We provide defensible space surveys. We maintain a very robust fuel treatment network. We have the neighborhood chipping program and we have enhanced community education, such as the things that we're doing like tonight. So set situational awareness. So we talk a lot about red flag warnings in Santa Barbara County. Unfortunately, we do have sundown or wind events and and we do fall prone to red flag conditions fairly often during the, the fall months. We're starting to see that more and more coming into the winter months and even in the spring. It used to just be a fall situation and now we're starting to see it throughout the year. So there is a slide up if you look at your screen that kind of talks about the criteria for red flag warnings. And there's a picture there that shows an example of the signs that we put up in Montecito when we are under a red flag warning. So situational awareness is huge. If you know that there's a red flag warning coming, that's definitely a time where you want to start thinking about what your game plan would be. So it may not, there might not be a fire in the area, but there is a red flag warning. So that's definitely a time where you want to maybe have a go bag, have those things packed in your car, have your keys ready, have your cell phone charged, start thinking about things that if you did have to wake up in the middle of the night, how you would get out and where everything would be. So do you have a plan? Where are you going to go? Does your family know where to meet you? How will you get there? When will you go? What if the power goes out? Do you know how to open your garage door and do you know where your keys are? So some of the biggest things that we hear from people who have been in a fire zone where they had to evacuate in the middle of the night are garage doors. So garage doors will not open if you lose power. So there is a manual switch to be able to open your garage door. And so a lot of times people don't have a concept of that. So they wake up in the middle of the night, they're under a mandatory evacuation warning, you're already confused. You go to get your car out of the garage and realize that you don't have any power you have no way to get your car out of the garage. So now you're evacuating on foot. So these are all the types of things that you wanna think of ahead of time. You don't wanna be trying to figure these things out in the middle of the night. Do you know where your keys are? That's always a big one too. Anyone that's attended any of these meetings here in Montecito, everyone in Mirage has probably already heard my pitch about that. I have little kids, I'm really bad with my car keys. Every day I get home, I put them in the same spot. At least that's my intention. But then every time I go to that same spot, they're never there. So I really try hard to, to hammer into people of always putting your car keys in one spot. Because again, at two in the morning, when you're trying to get your car out of the driveway and there's fire, that's not the time that you want to be looking for your car keys. Is your cell phone charged? That's another one. So a lot of times you're going to get that evacuation warning on your cell phone. However, if your cell phone isn't charged, you're not going to get that notification. Are your pets ready? So let's say you know there's a red flag warning in the area. That's definitely a time that you want to start thinking about what you're gonna do with your pets. If you're evacuating in the middle of the night, do you have food, do you have a bowl, do you have supplies for your pets? And what important documents do you need? Obviously, those are things that you wanna be thinking about ahead of time. And do you have the appropriate clothing and footwear? So that's a big one of lessons learned when we talk to folks who've had to evacuate in the middle of the night of thinking about if you're woken up in the middle of the night, what you're wearing to bed and running straight to your car and leaving. So do you have a change of clothes in the car? Do you have footwear so that you, if you do end up at a shelter, are you going to have shoes to wear? Are you going to have clothes to change into? So there's an indoor checklist. So some of the things we talk to people about is shutting all your windows and doors, shutting off your air conditioner and heater, closing your fireplace doors and the damper. That's a big one. We're, we're, we talk quite a bit about the fact that the majority of structures that do burn in wildland fires burn from the inside out. So it's not from direct flame impingement, but it's from the embers. And so a lot of times those embers come in through either an open window, open garage door, or a fireplace. Close all of your curtains and blinds. Leave your lights on so firefighters can see that you're 
see your house under smoky conditions. A lot of times those narrow streets, you can't see that there's a house there if you don't have a marker or a mailbox. But if you leave your lights on, it allows us to see that there's a home down at the end of the driveway. So an outdoor checklist. We talk about gathering up all the flammable items from the exterior of your home and bringing them in. So when we talk about stuff like that, we talk about those beautiful couches that you have in your backyard with pillows. You wanna strip your couches of those pillows, either throw them in the pool or throw them in your living room and close the door. The majority of those pillows and blankets, whatever you have on those couches are highly flammable. Don't leave your sprinklers on. This is a big misconception and things that we talk about often. So people often think they should leave their sprinklers on to add more moisture to their yard. Unfortunately, it really diminishes the water supply when we come in and try to use the hydrant. So if everyone has our sprinklers on, it's less water available to us to fight the fire. Close your garage doors and windows. That's something that we talked about on the last slide, but that's a really important one. So once you do leave and pull your car out of the garage, you wanna make sure that you remember to close that garage door behind you so that when the embers do blow up your driveway, that way they're not going into your garage and getting into little, in little hooches where they can start a fire from the inside. Disconnect electric garage doors. We kind of already talked about that. Disconnecting electric gates. Leave your gates open or unlocked. So that's a big one too, especially here in Montecito, a lot of our homes have big electric gates. So if you don't know a procedure to be able to open your electric gate when the power gets shut off, you're not gonna be able to get out. You're gonna to have to get out on foot. So these are the types of things we want you to think about ahead of time. Have a ladder available. That's always a really useful thing to have on your property. And consider a fireproof blanket for furniture and wood piles. So you can buy these fireproof blankets on Amazon. They're really simple for people that maybe don't wanna end up moving a wood pile or you don't wanna deal with moving furniture while you're evacuating. You can buy them on Amazon. You just throw them over your furniture or throw them over your wood pile and they're fireproof. It's a great thing to have around your house. Okay, so we're talking about set. I'm just gonna show you a little video clip right here that kind of hones in for you the reason why you don't wanna be thinking about all of these things as fire is bearing into your community. So this was a video that we took uh, the morning the Thomas fire came into Montecito. Let's see if it'll play for you. You probably don't have any sound on your end. I'm not sure why we don't have sound. It's much more exciting with sound, but as you can see, the winds there are probably blowing about 75 miles an hour. So if you're thinking about trying to evacuate out of your house, your house is right in the path of that fire. You're definitely not thinking about your dog bowls or a change of clothes or where your car keys are or important documents that you need to take with you. You're really just kind of thinking about what that fire is doing. And that's definitely not the time that we wanna be thinking about all that stuff. So any of the things that you can get ahead of time and really refer to that Ready, Set, Go document that we, that we mail out every year, it gives you a, a great plan to follow so that you can be prepared for that. I'm gonna to try to set you up for success here. Okay, there you go, Chief. Thank you, Maeve. Good to have you all with us in uh, talking about this uh, important topic and ever so timely. Um, my piece of this, uh, I pick it up at Go, uh, which is apropos as I'm the Division Chief of Operations. This is when We've taken, uh, it's time to take action. We are engaged and we're hoping that you have done your planning and preparation. You're ready, you were set, you watched your situational awareness and now it's time to go. Uh, our hope uh, is that your planning allows you uh, to leave as early as possible. So go early. By leaving early, you leave yourself the best chance to execute the plans that you had made during calm times. The best plans are those uh, that occurred before time was on you and you were the fires bearing down on you so that you have a calm plan you know exactly uh, how to execute you're just going down your your list and making things happen you're also allowing uh, to yourselves to get out of the way to allow room for the firefighters to come in and engage which was a big deal uh, during the Thomas fire that morning we just showed you when the winds were bearing down um, gaining access into uh, areas, uh, even with uh, the congestion of fire engines uh, and all, um, keeping the roads clear is, is paramount. And you leaving early helps that to occur. Remember to have your kit. This is your executing your plan. So all that planning you did is coming into action. The six Ps it talks about as you look into our Ready, Set, Go plan. People in pets is one, papers, 
phone numbers and important documents is two. Your uh, prescriptions and your eyeglasses, important things like that at the ready. Uh, your pictures and uh, irreplaceable items would be uh, number uh, four. Your personal computer, if you can put that in and have that set to go is five. And then of course, plastic, your credit cards and the important uh, cards and your cash as you're gonna be away from home for a while. And all of those things should have already been in your plan, ready to go. And now you grab and you go. When to leave. As you can see in the slide, uh, this, this is beyond the time to leave. The time to leave was before it got this bad where fire is down on you, amber cast is running across the road, visibility is poor, and you're re really uh, leaving and evacuating for your life. Leave early. That's the, the plan, when to leave. How are you gonna know to leave? Well, Everbridge is a, a tool we have to uh, harness uh, the technology to communicate with you. You pre-signed uh, uh, up for those through where, used to be where, where and prepare, now Santa Barbara um, ready. And uh, those notifications will occur. We also in Montecito have a good old fashioned AM radio 1610 where we can get that message out to you. So use all that technology, but best to use your own situational awareness. Be paying attention when they call a red flag, be paying attention as uh, the weather shifts. And if you get that little feeling in your gut that says, I shouldn't be here, don't wait for us to come and tell you to evacuate. Don't wait for a knock on the door. It's time to go. And, and go, execute your plan. This uh, is rather sensitive. And the where to go. Again, part of your planning already is where to go. Now, situational awareness dictates the options you have may become more narrow as there could be multiple fires or uh, a, a simple vehicle accident on the roadway congests a roadway that you thought was gonna be your escape route. Well, you've already thought about having a secondary route or multiple ways out and where to go. Uh, we'll talk about, the, we, we've already talked about it, the temporary evacuation point. Uh, with COVID on us, we'll have a, a moment to talk about COVID here too, but like you see on the slide here, a nice open parking lot away from harm's way, uh, upwind where the, it's not gonna blow the smoke on you and get all those things, be good uh, area to have a uh, nice, uh, uh, spacing so that we're doing all of those things that uh, we're supposed to be doing as well. And we're listening and, and, and paying attention to our social media and those uh, Everbridge alerts to tell us where uh, shelters are, where the temporary evacuation points are that, that other folks can come and, and assist you in those areas. So you're where to go, be, be thinking about that ahead of time. But as long as you're out of harm's way, you've chosen a great spot. How to get there, we already kind of talked about that. And here in the slide, you see congestion on those freeways. Um, it doesn't happen often here. There is a plan uh, if we need to reverse the flow on the freeways to have all the lanes leading away from the problem. You'll see this uh, type of thing occur in the hurricane states as the uh, approaching hurricanes come and there's mass evacuations occurring they reverse and all lanes on a major interstate will lead away from a community. We have the ability to do that through uh, Caltrans and the, the highway patrol here in, in Montecito. It takes time for that to occur. Um, you know, when we have time uh, and advanced warning, uh, we can do those things, but have multiple routes uh, out of the area. Know those ways. We always have that one way we seem to travel in and out of, of our homes and that's just how I go, that's, that's how I go. Well, every once in a while, you need to just kind of stop and take another way out and rehearse that occasionally as you practice your plan. Things that are practiced ahead of chaos tend to go much better when, uh, when time is pressing on you and it's time to go. It's kind of hard to see, it's a small screen there, but that wooden sign in the middle of those flames says wear a mask wash your hands, social distance, stay safe. And that's kind of puts it in perspective. That's really COVID. Uh, it's it's our, our risk and our, our, our priorities is life first. By all means, everything is about your life and, and, and getting out of harm's way is first. 
as we do that and we think about it in these times of, of COVID and, and, uh, and the, the uh, public health emergency that we're under, uh, yes, we want to try to have a mask. Yes, we want to try and wear that mask. We want to try and keep our distance from others. Um, and we want to certainly wash our hands, have hand sanitizer as part of your ready kit to go. Go to that temporary evacuation point in a parking lot. Uh, as the fire does its thing and moves through, maybe, maybe we'll be able to gain control of it early and you'll be released back to your home. Or uh, plans will be made as uh, the sheltering piece. The Red Cross has done a lot of work to uh, anticipate it. They have, it, <laughs> because of all the fires, they have uh, gotten great practice at uh, sheltering large populations during COVID. Um, shelters that have spacing, uh, utilizing uh, hotel space, motel space, to allow families to uh, congregate and be away from others, but yet be supported by those uh, important items that, uh, and things that the Red Cross and others can provide you when uh, you've been blocked out of, of your normal access. Many folks though, don't re rely on the shelter. They have their plan, they go to relatives, they know of relatives out of the area, uh, they'll go and, and seek shelter on their own elsewhere, which is perfectly fine. Um, but we are, um, the plans are in place should we have to uh, shelter folks. And COVID is just, as we figured out, just what it is. We've been very fortunate through the, the fight, the wildland fire fight this season, that very few, there have been transmissions of COVID to firefighters working out on these uh, lines, but nowhere near the uh, kind of the horrors we thought in our, our pre-planning that my goodness, if, if we really had engine companies taken out, hand crews taken out because somebody were sick uh, and just the, uh, the, the quarantining and isolation that would go on that would really hamper us. We haven't seen that, thank goodness. So uh, we, we plan for it. It's there if we need to take uh, precautions and do those things, but knock on the good wood that, uh, that isn't our experience to date. So uh, that kind of is our presentation. We talked about preparedness, the being ready, being set, being situationally aware, and we've talked about impl implementing your plan and going. Uh, that's, that is ready, set, go. It's on our website for if those, we went too quickly through some of these items, uh, feel free to go and, and, and uh, we have them available. Uh, they are available online though, so that you can go through and, and develop your plan and really digest the things we've talked about presented here. Maybe you'll come up with more. There's many sources to, to inform yourself on how to prepare. And what works for the wildland setting and preparedness and, and evacuation, we, we know too well that it also fits other scenarios for us if we're ready to, uh, to evacuate in any circumstance and to think about those ahead of time as well. At this point, uh, our, we want to extend to our partners uh, for this evening and we want to, uh, we're going to switch the screen over. So I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can hear from our uh, Mirage team as they talk about their uh, program and share what they have for us. So Troy, if you take it away. All right. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, it looks great. Great. All right. Let me get to where I can also see it. Well, thanks, Chief. I'm glad to be with you today. I'd love to be visible to you all as well as the others have. Uh, alas, the camera on my computer I'm using quit working when I did a recent software update. It's kind of vexing, but I'm sorry not to connect in a more personal way. Mirage is pleased to join the fire district and bucket brigade in helping you be poised for personal action in the wildfire season that's so obviously already upon us and, and you know, kind of surrounding Santa Barbara County in a certain way. The Montecito Emergency Response and Recovery Action Group has been the official citizenry outreach sponsored by the Fire District, the Sanitary District, and the Water District since 1987. Our vision is to keep ensuring, as we have over the decades, that Montecito remains a resilient and self-reliant community. We pursue that in several ways. Um, let's see, I guess I missed something here. What happened my, oh, well, I'm gonna go to a slide that, didn't work right. Sorry, folks. Um, well, I'll just say, 10 months every year, historically on Thursday mornings, though interrupted by COVID, we offer free trainings open to the community. 
We've also put in place a robust network of communications by radio to help neighborhoods respond nimbly when disaster strikes. We staff the official information kiosks at the village lawn and the trailheads on red flag days, and we maintain an active presence at community events, helping manage parking, sharing useful emergency tips and other contributions to the community. A variety of ways in which we uh, are part of what happens in, in Montecito. And we are a team of people, and I want to answer the obvious question, who is the team? Well, Montecito is the team, you are the team. Uh, how? How credible is that? What do I mean by that? Here are some of the ways that, that that's so. There's a response team. When a major incident occurs, a group of citizens stand ready to assist in the response under the guidance of the fire chief. We're always looking for people to help carry that role. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. There's a radio team. About 40 radios are distributed around Montecito in neighborhoods, HOAs, schools, businesses, institutions. Each of them participates in a monthly call-out drill that keeps our skills up and ensures that our gear is working right. A slate of helpers takes on occasional assignments such as working the kiosk, uh, educating hot day hikers, uh, delivering masks on behalf of the Montecito Associate Association. A project team works now and then on special projects as they come up, such as taking an inventory of our specialized mobile communications van or helping with an ongoing upgrade to our radio network. The leadership team meets monthly, that's the board, and we uh, provide ongoing guidance and direction that keeps Mon uh, Mirage moving forward into the new worlds of technology and social media while keeping our historical services on track. The sustenance team, th those are the folks who, who uh, help this happen in a, a financial way. Our annual letter is going to show up in your mailbox or your in and or your inbox shortly. We hope you will respond by helping to sustain our work. Our annual dues are very modest. Many Montecitans willingly donate beyond the basics, and so we're grateful for your generosity. And if none of the above fits your interests or availability, our whole community still relies on you to be a part of the solution when we face disruption together. We hope you'll participate in the monthly training so you'll feel more confident and capable both in anticipating disaster and in coping with it. It's been proven over and over again that preparation matters, that people, when they face a situation and have had the training behind them, they can move swiftly into a, a suitable response rather than running around with ch like chickens with their heads cut off. It's, it's such a confidence inspiring feeling uh, uh, to, to feel like you're capable and knowledgeable when you're moving forward into a, ch a challenging situation like that. As we're learning more about what's possible with remote technology, we plan to resume offering opportunities to become trained and certified in the National CERT program in the coming year. CERT is a, is a great way to uh, learn the, the, the broad array of things that are helpful to you and to your family and to your neighborhood in the case of a, a disaster situation. And I can't speak for my uh, successor as president and the 2021 Mirage Board, but I anticipate they will continue the work of enhancing the radio network that's so crucial to disaster communications. If your radio doesn't, if your neighborhood doesn't have a radio yet, reach out to us to explore what's involved in that. It's very easy, simply go to mirage.org slash inquire. That's mirage.org slash inquire. And let us know if you'd like to get certified or to check on having a radio in your neighbor, neighborhood or to pitch in on any of the teamwork underway to help Montecito respond and recover effectively. I'm now pleased to hand the mic over to Abe Powell from our community partner, Bucket Brigade. He's gonna offer you guidance on another important way for you to be prepared, your insurance. So to you, Abe. You can just grab the mute and go. I can't hear you, Abe, so you just need to unmute still. Thank you, Troy. And I'll mute me. Can you hear me now? Yep. Very good. Okay. Let's see if we get this screen sharing working. All right. Can you see my screen? Everybody see my screen now? You're up. Fantastic. Okay. My name is John Abraham Powell. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade. I grew up here in Montecito um, and have been involved in community resilience work 
since in some ways 1977, which was the Sycamore Canyon fire, which just happened to go down my backyard <laughs> as a little kid. And um, uh, I've been involved in the Mountain Drive Community Association uh, as board president, also as a volunteer firefighter with the Breast Six volunteers that were umbrellaed under the Montecito Fire Protection District. And um, I'm currently involved in this Bucket Brigade community building project. And our goal is to build community resilience now in the face of what's happening all around us. Um, tonight, our role is to talk about insurance in the age of climate change. Um, because, you know, back when I was growing up, um, people talked about insurance in case a disaster happened. But after all that we've been through here in Santa Barbara, uh, now we talk about insurance for when a disaster happens. Um, natural disasters have always been a part of life uh, for every society throughout human history um, and also here in Santa Barbara County. But over the last 40 years, we've seen a very significant shift in, um, in the types of disasters and the scope of those disasters that we've been facing. So when we look at wildfires in Santa Barbara County, you can see over the last four decades that in terms of acres burned, we've seen a doubling and then a doubling again. Um, that's cause for concern uh, on many levels, um, but we're not alone here in Santa Barbara because when we look at federally declared disasters in the state of California, we've seen uh, a, a 3x increase uh, in declared disasters across the entire state. And within the last 10 years, we now see a curve within the curve so that uh, starting in 2011, when we were having a quarter of a million acres burned uh, in a year, that we could come in 2020 to a point where we would have 4 million acres burned uh, and we're not done with fire season. Um, so um, uh, there's a lot of concern in California, but uh, what we're seeing here is also representative of what's happening around the country. So a billion dollar disaster events are natural disasters that cost uh, more than a billion dollars in damages and that's CPI adjusted. So since the 1980s, the frequency of these events has doubled and then doubled again. And as you can see from this graph, the cost has literally gone through the roof and that's significant for our country uh, it's significant for us and the people that have been involved in these disasters, for first responders, but also for insurance companies. Now, what we've seen in all these graphs is, is uh, that the data tells us that the threat to life and property we're facing from natural disaster has increased and is increasing. So the question comes to us, what are we going to do about this? Um, and tonight's focus is a community resilience building around your first line of economic defense in a natural disaster, and that's your insurance policy. Um, and our goal is to help our neighbors understand your insurance policy and what a good insurance policy looks like. Um, disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an insurance agent. We're not selling any policies or giving any legal advice, but we are giving neighborly advice because I come from a multi-generational tradition of life here in the WUI and the Bucket Brigade, its goal is to collect community wisdom and share that uh, in this community and all the communities around us to help us uh, deal with these challenges that we're facing. Um, another disclaimer is I now have 10 minutes to uh, do this insurance presentation. And if I talk about this for an hour or even an hour and a half, there would still be a lot to talk about. Um, so if I go too fast or you have a question or I don't cover something you think is important, um, that's understandable and we will have a little time in Q&A to go over some of these things. But we're going to focus on the basics and I call this three things I wish we knew before my mother's house burned down in the tea fire in 2008. Um, here is my mother's house the day after the tea fire. Um, as you can see, uh, this was uh, a house that we thought was ready for a fire. It is a plaster covered house. It had fire safe windows, it had, had a tile roof, it had no eaves, it had screen vents, and yet it burned down. Um, and the question to all of us is, <laughs> if this is your house, 
um, is this the time you want to wonder about what kind of insurance you have? And the answer is no. <laughs> you want to know well before you're looking at your house in this kind of shape. So the question is, how much coverage do you have? And is that enough? And that is a very important thing to fully understand as a homeowner or as a renter. Both homeowners and renters need to have insurance in a place like Santa Barbara. And the answer to how much coverage do I have and is it enough is it's complicated. Insurance policies are very complicated. Many of them are 50 to 70 pages of complicated legal language. So I'm going to grossly oversimplify this for you tonight uh, in the, uh, it, it, to, to keep this short and to try to keep it as simple as possible. So if you do one thing, if you learn one thing from this insurance webinar, it is going to be to read and understand one page of your policy simple as we can get it and that page is your insurance declarations this is the cheat sheet to your insurance policy and this is where your coverages and deductibles and the limits of those coverages are clearly listed uh, and this is the most important page in your policy now is there other stuff that you want to be aware of in the other 40 50 70 pages of your policy the answer is yes absolutely are we going to talk about that tonight probably not but let's talk about the key coverage you need as a homeowner to have a full recovery in a natural disaster. And the first and most important thing is coverage A. Are you covered for the full replacement value of your house? Um, sorry, my dog is a chew toy. Um, <laughs> the second thing is coverage B. Um, are you covered for the full replacement value of the outbuildings at your property? So that an outbuilding could be anything from a tool shed to an ADU to a freestanding garage. Okay, next thing, coverage C. That this is all the possessions in your home, uh, the things that make a house into a home. So whether it's we're talking about couches and dining room tables, chairs, cups and plates, uh, you know, towels, curtains, all of those things are included in your coverage C or your personal contents um, and is your policy ready to replace all of those things and do you know what that amount might even be? Uh, number four is loss of use or additional living expense. Now this is the money that will be availed to you from your policy to pay rent to live somewhere else while you rebuild your home and what we learned and what most people who have been through a loss have learned is that rebuilding takes a lot longer than you think it will. So <clears throat> I've just thrown a lot of information at you, but we're going to simplify this by looking at a sample declarations page and we're going to think about this and I want each of you to think about this in relation to your policy. You have a policy, you can take it out and look at your declarations page. If you don't, you can take this out later, but we're going to go through this, the key coverages line by line. So here we see a sample policy and uh, we see the premium they pay. Uh, and we see coverages and deductibles. So coverage A, this is the money that would, you would get from the insurance company to pay for rebuilding your destroyed home after a wildfire. Okay, now this person has $200,000 limit on their coverage A with a $1,000 deductible. Now, is $200,000 enough? Uh, the answer in Santa Barbara is if your house is under 400 square feet, maybe. But uh, if it's bigger than that, that's not going to be enough money. And if you don't have enough money to rebuild, completely rebuild your house, you're going to have to figure out how to rebuild under duress. And um, I really don't recommend doing that. So getting this coverage right is going to be the key to this policy. Now, the next thing, coverage B. This is the other structures on your property. This person has $20,000 limit on coverage B. Now, if they have one garden shed on their property, they're probably covered enough. But if they have an ADU or a guest house or uh, a freestanding garage, they're grossly undercovered. This is going to be a problem. They're going to need higher coverage for that. Okay, now let's look at coverage C. Um, this is personal property protection. So this is all the belongings that are in your home. This person has $100,000. Now, for someone like me, that might be enough money. Um, that might be enough money to um, 
to cover you, but uh, there are people in this community that have $100,000 worth of personal property in their walk-in closet. So understanding the kind of possessions you have, the amount of possessions that you have, and what you would actually want to be able to replace after a wildfire is an important part of understanding your insurance policy. Now, last of all, we see they have $20,000 of additional living expense or ALE. Um, that means that uh, and, and their policy lasts up to 12 months uh, for ALE. So they will have 12 months and they have $20,000 uh, for uh, additional living expense to rebuild their home. Now, the question for that person is, if your home burned down, could you actually rebuild it in Santa Barbara County in 12 months? And for most of us, the answer to that is no. Second thing is, uh, is $20,000 enough to rent a place for 12 months comparable to your home? And for most of us, the answer to that question is no. So this person is underinsured and they are vulnerable. They have no, they do not have enough coverage to be economically resilient in this community. And so how would we fix this policy? How could we turn this policy into something? If this was you, how could you make this into a policy that could cover you properly for your home? That's the next question. Now, Another question is, who's responsible for making sure this coverage right? A lot of people think that the insurance company is supposed to set these numbers correctly, but that's not the case. You are responsible for making sure that your coverage levels are adequate. And so let's talk about how to do that. So the most important one we talked about earlier, coverage A. This is the money to rebuild your house. If you get one thing right in your insurance policy, let's get this one right. So there are three steps, three simple steps to take each year to make sure you have proper coverage A in your policy. Step one, ask one or three, I would recommend reputable local builders, um, how much it costs per square foot to rebuild a home like yours in your community. They're gonna give you a number. In Montecito, that number is generally somewhere between $500 and $800 a square foot. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but that's what it costs here to rebuild a home. But you need to update this each year. So you ask your builders, how much per square foot? And they say to you, $500 a square foot for your kind of home. And you say, okay, how many square feet is my home? And you apply this to the annual coverage A formula. So you take the total square feet of your home, the total cost per square foot to rebuild, and you end up with an approximate coverage A number. That is a very important number. So whatever number that is, that is the minimum amount of coverage A you want on your insurance policy. So once you get this number, let's say you had a thousand foot home and it was $500 a square foot, you'd want <laughs> a lot of money, right? Okay. So, um, you need to call your insurance agent and you need to set your policy at that level or higher. Okay, so we've talked about coverage A. That's how you do it and you do it every year. Now, what about these other, other coverages? We need to do our homework. Now, coverage B, lucky for us, is exactly the same process as coverage A. Um, if you want to know how much it'll cost to rebuild the outbuildings, your freestanding garage or your guest house, you ask reputable builders, how much per square foot to rebuild something like that. You multiply by the square feet, you get an answer. That's how much you need for all of the, all of the outbuildings on your property. Now, coverage C is a little more complicated. How much is everything in your house worth? Your dining room table, your couches, your, your uh, um, towels, your clothes, your jewelry. Um, how much is all of that worth? Um, and you can't just ask someone else about that. You're going to have to figure it out. And so what we do and what we recommend is to make a video of your home. Take your iPhone out, take your cell phone, make a video of each room of your home all the way around 365 degrees. Walk through the whole house and then watch that video and start to think about what those things might cost. Look up the big ticket items on the internet. See how much they cost right now and start making a list. How much is this worth? And get yourself in the ballpark here. Now, a tip is save that video because if you lose your home and all of the stuff in that home, that video will help you fill out the contents uh, inventory 
for your insurance policy so that you can get paid to replace those items. Now, last tip tonight, understanding ALE. Now, this one uh, is, is very important in a disaster, and I'm speaking from experience on this. Um, it's, it's critical. So uh, additional living expense coverage is uh, coverage for the costs incurred by you, the policyholder, if you are displaced from your home uh, in a disaster because it's destroyed, right? Now, what is ALE? How long does it last? Most coverage lasts 12 months. That's the average amount of time. In a declared disaster, uh, this coverage is extended to 24 months, um, which is quite a bit longer, but might not even be long enough to rebuild. Now, does anybody in the audience know anyone who's rebuilt after a disaster in 12 months? I personally do not. And I know a lot of people that have had to rebuild, hundreds. Um, it took us 24 months to negotiate our insurance settlement before we could start to rebuild. Uh, and we were completely out of ALE before we even broke ground on our home. So getting the ALE right is really important. And the way to do this, I think, is the as a minimum, is to call a realtor and ask them how much it would cost to rent a home like yours in the community per month. And take that number, multiply it by 24. And if you have that much coverage, that much ALE coverage, whatever that number is, um, you're in the ballpark. If you're less than that, you're in the danger zone. Um, so that's my tip on ALE. This is from experience. Um, you don't want to get caught with inadequate ALE. And that is the shotgun wedding approach to reading your insurance policy and your um, declarations page. Um, if you need more information, you can contact us through our website, sbbucketbrigade.org, and we encourage everyone to join us and to help build resilience uh, throughout the community and throughout Santa Barbara County. Now, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Abe and Troy. Uh, can't tell you what great partners in the community you both are and, and what it means to, uh, to share from uh, one, the side of, of preparedness and response and the other, this insurance issue that is that little thing that we need to talk about that we don't talk about enough uh, to prepare. This is, night has been all about preparing you to, uh, to deal with the, the hardship during a disaster. We uh, commented at the beginning of this that we would monitor the chat and there's been a couple of questions that have been thrown out and, and we want to address those before uh, we wrap this up. We uh, had a question about red flag alert. What, what do we do during a red flag warning? What does that mean? Uh, and it means a lot to us. This is, uh, this is part of preparedness. This is part of situational awareness. This isn't something that just happens to us. Uh, we work with our partners at the Weather Service. So days in advance of uh, critical fire weather occurring, we start communicating with the Weather Service and our allied partner agencies in, the, the, in, in this whole region from LA all the way up to San Luis Obispo. And we uh, all talk about what the weather changes are going to be. If it looks like it's going to trigger a red flag warning, uh, and we start preparing days in advance. With that preparation, we come up to the point where it's time to uh, alert the community to get their situational awareness in place. When we know that, that what is predicted by a modeling computer three days out is actually gonna be something that, that materializes and occurs. So we don't over warn, that's something we don't wanna do. So we, we know that it's gonna occur. We, Place notice in the media so that you start seeing it through all the media outlets that uh, red flag is uh, predicted and for how long and for what areas it's going to uh, occur in. And then we start doing our own uh, uh, communication in the district, seven different locations. As you come into the community, you should not drive any of the routes into the community without seeing a sign that alerts you to the red flag, red flag warning. And uh, little sandwich board signs on the side of the road we also have uh, the trailheads marked so that people that are going up into um, the more risky environment there where it's susceptible to uh, starts from the human causes, they should see those warnings and probably wave off. That would be our, our choice. 
But if they do go, we want them to engage uh, safely and uh, not to uh, be the source or cause of anything that, that occurs. Um, we also uh, prepare through upstaffing. We, we uh, not only in our own department, we will put on extra staffing, we will staff extra rigs, we'll have them out patrolling in the areas to uh, reduce that response time. If something occurs during that critical period, we wanna be uh, responding uh, with as much uh, initial force as we can to put it down early. That's another great way to avoid all these problems is to put that fire to bed early uh, and get on it. We also don't do any of this by ourselves. We've seen that time and time again. And the Thomas fire uh, with, with multiple days of preparation and watching that fire come to us, uh, we were able to amass a very large army of, uh, of firefighters. Uh, we'll do that to the best we can early on in, uh, in our own operational area that we work with our partners. We all get on the phone and, and we all share uh, what we've done to uh, augment our staffing. We are aware of uh, the assets that are available to us through the, our aircraft. Aircraft, a big piece of, uh, of the initial attack and controlling these uh, events. So we all share those uh, uh, upstaffs and, and situational awareness so that we know down to the moment what is available should something occur and start. Um, that's, that's red flag for us. Um, our other neighboring departments to do some uh, posting of roads and, and uh, moving cars out of the roadways. Um, the, everything is about, uh, we don't know where it can occur, but if it does, we're all gonna sound the alarm and jump on it and put it down as quickly as possible. Most importantly though, as we said, getting you out of the way. If we get you out of the way, the life safety risk, uh, the risk to our firefighters goes way down. Um, we will risk a lot to save a life. And if your life is in there, we will do everything we can to assist and save you. If you, your, all the lives have been removed from the scenario, then we're to property and uh, environment, cultural and, and natural and, uh, and uh, infrastructure assets. We will protect those, uh, but not at the ultimate uh, risk. So uh, it's so important that we get this preparedness taken care of and uh, get our plans in place. When that pretty much answers that question, uh, I'd like to throw it over. The next question we had was uh, the community emergency response team training cert. And so that belongs to uh, Troy, if you could uh, answer that question for us, please. Sure, Chief Whitney. Um, yes, the uh, question was, can the cert package be taken online? It is available. Um, individuals can go to ready.gov slash cert, C-E-R-T. That's R-E-A-D-Y dot G-O-V, short for government slash CERT, Community Emergency Response Training. And uh, we'll be happy to post that information on our website. I imagine you'll be able to find it ultimately on Montecito Fire and Bucket Brigade sites as well as, I'm guessing that I can't speak for them, but I, I'm, they, they have rich resources on those sites as well. So uh, yes, it can be taken online, much of it. Um, there might be some elements of it in order to get fully certified that have to be done uh, live. I'm not positive about that, but, uh, but I know that much of your, the work can be done online. If, while I have the mic, I'd like to just underscore one thing. Um, I appreciate Abe talking about the video record. I was responsible for the uh, risk management and insurance management for the college, Westmore College for many years, uh, recently retired, but we, we did take a video record of all of our contents in, uh, in in, 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 some, in some years before the T fire, it made a huge, huge difference in the settlement to have to be able to show drawer by drawer, closet by closet, um, classroom by classroom, what stuff did we have in there and what stuff did we lose. Uh, so I, I really want to say that was really important, and it was also uh, important to have a set of it offsite as well. So thanks, Abe, for raising that point. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, yeah, that's great. And, and you know, as we know, so much is available to us online and, and there's, there's a, a plethora of sites to go to, entities that, that want to get the word out and, and they're all valid and, and we, we support that. Um, we're not familiar with, uh, somebody has asked a question about an app called Smoke D Alerts. 
uh, we'll research that and report back. Again, it's, it's so much technology out there to, uh, to keep up with and, and a lot of, of tools becoming available to us. Um, one of the things uh, we watch is the network of cameras that is available through uh, the uh, uh, power grid towers uh, up and down the state. And uh, it's a great tool for uh, getting eyes into areas that we can't uh, rapidly access with our vehicles to know that there's actually a, a, an event occurring. So, but uh, smoke D alerts app, we, we'll check into that. So, uh, that appears to be uh, the majority of what was asked in, not the majority, that is everything that was asked in chat. Uh, that's the program we wanted to present to you this evening. Uh, one of the beauties of technology, again, is all of this has been recorded. And uh, all of our entities, our partners tonight, uh, Mirage and the Bucket Brigade, as well as the Montecito Fire Department, will have them on our websites. Uh, so that you can, again, review this uh, if you want to share it with other uh, members of your family or, or friends that you know could benefit from this. Uh, again, going to um, our website uh, and looking at Ready, Set, Go, you can get uh, resource yourself a ton uh, through that. And uh, that being said, we appreciate your uh, time this evening. We don't want to, to uh, hammer that and, and take all of your evening away from you. But we wanted to take a, just a piece of time out and talk about this important uh, preparedness step and uh, make it available to you. So thank you to our partners. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we just encourage safety and, uh, and go out there and uh, get yourself prepared. Thank you. Best to you all. <laughs>